we'll read for our text one verse, the last verse of the chapter, verse 14. Psalm 19 and verse 14, it says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. The title of my message this morning is The Meditation of Your Heart. As you read through the Psalms, you find that the psalmist is often writing things very, very personal. And so when I read, I like to take things personal as well. And so when you, when you read this or when you're hearing a sermon from it, take it personal. Uh, take it very personal. And so when I read this, I say, let, I, I read it like this, let the words of David's mouth. And the meditation of David's heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, David's strength and David's redeemer. Don't ever read the scriptures or hear a sermon and think within your heart, well, I wish so and so were here to hear this, or I'm going to circle this and make sure that so and so gets this. The one it's intended for is the one that you were looking at this morning when you looked in the mirror. So I know it was intended for me. The words of my mouth those are the things that I say, the way I say them, the tone, what comes out verbally, my communication, the meditation of my heart. Now, Mr. Webster, in his dictionary, he defined meditation as close or continued thought. The turning or revolving of a subject on the mind. Serious contemplation. The psalmist is speaking of inward thoughts. The, the things that are always on my mind. The things that are always on your mind. It's not mere quietness or daydreaming. You know, some of the Eastern religions, they have you sit still and, you know, yoga and that sort of thing. They sit still and close your eyes and empty your brain. That's not, that's not meditation. Not in the sense that the Bible speaks of it. You woke up this morning. I woke up this morning. What was the first thing on your mind when you woke up? What was the first thing you thought of? bed last night, what was the last thing you thought of? As you go through the day, what is it you're thinking of? The psalmist said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. The two are very intricately connected. You speak what's on your mind. You ever get around somebody and they go on and on on a certain subject, especially when they can't think of anything else to talk about and they get nervous and they, they just go talking about something. They talk about what interests them, what they know a lot about, what they think about. Your speech, your words, your tone is all a reflection of your heart. And while you and I, we can't see the heart, we hear the voice. In Matthew chapter 12, notice what Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 12. Be 
you know, verse 33, he says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Jesus gives the illustration of the, of the tree, that you'll know a tree by its fruits. And the corrupt tree brings forth evil fruits. And the good tree brings forth good fruit. You see, the problem isn't the fruit. The problem is the tree. And what's going on with the, the tree? Sometimes we like to treat the symptoms. Especially... When it comes to our children, we're good at making good little hypocrites out of them because we treat the symptoms and we, we don't treat the heart. Maybe because we're so good at it ourselves. Hypocrisy is speaking something from our mouth which isn't in our hearts. Yeah, we can dress up little Johnny and make him look real pretty, but if there's a heart problem, what's that going to do? Eventually it comes out, doesn't it? In Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 7, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh, unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude, and saith unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. God knows our mouth and our heart. You see, the problem isn't that which goes in that defiles. You see, that which goes in, it goes through the digestive system, and then the waste product comes out. That's how life works. But there's a problem with the heart, and that waste comes up out of the mouth. And he talks about the hypocrisy there. They draw nigh with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What I'm trying to say here is that whenever we look at this, and we look at this text there in Psalms 19, your heart needs to be right with God. And your mouth will reflect what God has done in your heart. And there will be consistency there. In the book of James chapter 1 and verse 26, he says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. What does it mean to seem to be religious? Well, you go and talk to people, you know, and uh, witness to folks. funerals like I have. Just about everybody says they're saved. The 
and say they're on their way to heaven, say they went to heaven. I'm talking about funerals. Brother Jackson said, I was listening to him on the, on the internet. <clears throat> Brother Jackson said he went to a funeral one time. Said the preacher pre was preaching a funeral for a man that supposedly belonged to the church that this man was pastor of. But the man, the dead man, was someone that the preacher had never seen. And the guy got up in the, in the pulpit to preach his funeral. He said, now, this man supposedly was a member of this church. He said, I never seen him. What's it mean to seem to be religious? What's that mean? Seem to be religious. Well, it means that someone who thinks himself to be on his way to heaven, someone who focuses on the outside, does all the outward acts that he can do. Maybe even to his friends, his neighbors, his fellow church members. Maybe even looks like he's on his way to heaven. But he isn't. His religion is outside only. Nothing's changed in the heart. It's based on show only. And there may be, even this morning, someone sitting in a pew, if not here, somewhere in a Baptist church, Sunday morning after Sunday morning, never having been saved, but seeming to be religious. Now look, I'll never understand poor church attendance. There's times when we have to miss. And there's times when we can't be here regularly. I can't be here regularly right now. It's hard when you live far away. Brother, Brother Craig knows it's hard when you don't live close. It's hard when you're sick. It's hard when you've got things going on that you're providentially hindered and not able to be at church. But if you're able to be at church, I believe you ought to be here every time the doors are open. We have a clear command of God to be a church as God's people, to assemble ourselves together. How in the world do we expect our religion to get us to heaven if we can't get us to church? Amen. Like I say, I understand. I believe God understands when there's circumstances that we can't. But hear me now. Coming to church every time the doors are open won't save anybody. There's no salvation in coming to church. There's no salvation in baptism. There's no salvation in doing outward works. That's right. There's salvation in Jesus Christ only. Amen. You can do all kinds of nice things. You can come in here, dress up real nice, drop money in the box, and sit here every week and still be on your way to an eternal heaven if you don't know Jesus Christ. If your heart is not right with the Lord, you'll never be right. If this describes anyone who's watching the video or listening to this or even here today, you know, even my children, listen. Make your calling 
and election sure. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Over in Matthew chapter 23. Let me tell you, my sister, my sister was, uh, she made a profession before me when we were kids. And she went through church. I mean, we all thought she was saved. And it wasn't until, until we, were, we were adults. And I believe it was down there in Inverness she was, she was saved as an adult. You know? It's possible to go through a long time playing a game. Matthew chapter 23 Verses 25 through 28. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. You see, Jesus knew their heart. And the Pharisees, they... These, these Pharisees and these scribes, they were hypocrites. Jesus, Jesus knew it. And he said, you're like, you're, you're, like the, you're like the sepulchers there in the cemetery. Listen, I, I, I love to walk through cemeteries. In fact, coming down from North Carolina, you all may think I'm crazy. But I have these kids, and they, and, and they, like, to, they like to have energy, and, 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 and it's hard in the car and stuff. And I like to get out and stretch. And Jill wasn't feeling good, so she was asleep. And... We pulled off at an old cemetery. And you know what we did? We walked. Me and the kids, we walked in that old cemetery. And uh, we, we looked at those tombs, those, those gravestones, and, and, and we shot some pictures. And, and we looked around, and we talked about what their lives must have been. And we looked at the verses that were written on there and the testimony that those people were there. And, you know, uh, Jesus used them for an illustration too. He said, look, he said, he said, y'all are like that. Those whited sepulchers. They're beautiful outward, but inside, they're dead. They're dead. I don't know that about people, but Jesus did. And one day we'll stand before the Lord, every one of us in this world. And He knows. And so listen. Listen. That's what's most important is the heart. But once you've come to know the Lord, once you've known the Lord, and after you know the Lord, Psalm 19 and verse 14, this needs to be your prayer and mine. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Praise the Lord. God has given us a new heart, but we struggle with that old flesh. And so every day we struggle. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, 1 Timothy 4 and 12. He, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. We're to be an example to the believers. In word, that's the things that we say. In conversation, the things we do, the, and, and all the way down the line, in purity, in, in the heart, the things that we are. Be an example. There's work to be done. Jesus is more to you and me than just a fire escape. He didn't save us 
just to sit on the sidelines and wait for him to come back. Oh, he may come back today, and I hope he does. But if he doesn't, there's still work to be done. Do you wish to be used for the Lord? I do. I do. I can't wait to see what the Lord does. I don't know how long He puts me here on this earth. How long... I, 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 and, and, uh, I, like I said, I don't, I don't like to move. Uh, I'm, once I get moved down here, I'm, I'm hoping to be here until He calls me out of here in the rapture. Puts my y'all put my body back here in this graveyard. You know, that's, that's just the extent of it. <laughs> we'll see what the Lord does, but there's work to be done. What do you want in life? We all have different callings, different places in the in the economy of God, in the plan of God. Let us all pray this prayer. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. But it begins in the heart. And when we, when we think about that, regardless of where you sit this morning, whether you're a new, newly saved or a seasoned Christian. How is it that you can have meditation of your heart that is acceptable unto God? And so for just the next few minutes, I'd like for us to consider how. How can we have this meditation of our heart that is acceptable to God? We've got three points, very quickly. First of all, recognize sources of wrong thinking. Recognize sources of wrong thinking. I love computers. I use computers a lot. That's my, part of my job. I sit and look at a computer screen all day long, sometimes, sometimes for many hours. Somebody asked me how I enjoyed my week in North Carolina. Well, it wasn't much different than Ohio because I sit and work in it all the time. <laughs> but, <coughs> but that's just part of what I do. <clears throat> Staring at a computer screen. You know, computers, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. sick, I promise, this is chronic. Computers have a way about them. Bad programming causes issues with computers. You put a bad program in on a computer, it'll do bad things. And that, that's true whether it's a MacBook or a Windows machine. You put a bad program in there, it'll do bad things. And so it is with you and me. Garbage in, garbage out, they used to say. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> it says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So I'm talking about be careful of the people that you hang out with. Listen, if you're saved today, make it a point to be friends with other Christians. Now, I'm not talking about totally separating yourself from the rest of the world. Otherwise, how in the world would you ever do any business with other people? Or better yet, how in the world would you ever witness to anybody else? But whenever I'm talking about friendships, your best friends in this world ought to be other, other believers. And it takes work. And don't, don't sit at home and say, oh, I wish so-and-so were my friend. You know, get busy trying to make friends. 
the wise preacher of Proverbs said, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And I think we need to work on that sometimes. And I'm amazed how hard it is for us to keep friends and make friends with all the communication we've got going on in this world. But we need to be careful who we have as friends. I'm thankful for my kids when they get to go to Bible conferences and they get to hang out with other other young people at Bible conferences. Uh, you know, uh, those uh, Troy and Sarah's kids uh, and then uh, some of uh, some of the new boys and, and some of them that y'all are familiar with, uh, you know, that's good. I like it when they're, they're with those young people. I don't like it so much when my daughter's out there in the front yard with her dog and all the neighborhood boys come running into the yard. That kind of makes me nervous, you know. But it's good when they make good Christian friends. But also, be careful of what you're watching on TV. Now here's the deal. Everything that you watch on TV, every program, whether it's short or long, has an agenda behind it. Now, I'm not saying to throw out your television. I've got a TV in my house. But I'm saying just be careful what you watch and understand there's an agenda behind it. The cursing, the sex, the drugs... The violence, it's all meant to take you away from the things of God and the God of the Bible. Lead by example. You see, now while we're watching TV, mom and dad and grandpa and grandma, our kids and grandkids are watching us. And so, you know, what kind of thing are we saying to our kids and our grandkids when we say, oh, I can't watch this until you leave the room? Wait a minute. It's not all about them. The Lord's watching us, you see. If it's bad for them, it's probably bad for us. Watch out for the things we read. You know, there's some books that aren't worth the paper they were printed on. Now, obviously, I like books. Uh, I'd be a liar if I said I didn't like books. But there's some books out there that just aren't worth the paper that they're printed on. You know, uh, Joe Olstein novels aren't worth anything. Uh, but uh, there's some romance novels out there that aren't worth anything either. And, and, and just be careful. Those sort of things are programming you with a certain agenda. But on the flip side, secondly, understand the sources of good or correct thinking. In Psalms 119, verses 9 through 11, underline this, memorize it, keep it close to you. It says, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, he says this. Joshua 1 and verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Oh, how we ought to consider the Word of God. We all have TVs in our house. We all have Bibles in our house. Now I'm thankful that y'all brought your Bibles to church and not your TV. It's a good thing, right? 
The question is, how much time do we spend in our Bibles at home? Right? Uh, so, well, I know we all turn our TVs on at home. And again, that's not bad, but the question is, do we open up our Bibles at home? We need to be in God's Word daily. Daily. As Baptists, we believe that the Bible is our only rule of faith and practice. But that the Word of God needs to be our only source of good programming. Read it, not just at church, but every day of the week. Read it individually. Read it as a family. Study it. Meditate on it. You know, don't read it just to read it and then forget about it. But read it. Meditate on it. Consider what God has to say. Read it, not like you're at the doctor's office and and then, you know, you just lay it aside. Go on, don't read it just to check off for the day. I'd rather see somebody read a verse a day and get something out of it than to read a chapter or two and not get anything out of it, right? Meditate on it. Feast on it. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. In verse 8. Notice what he says here. He says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Oh, where are we going to find that? To think on it. No, you're not going to find it on Fox News. You're not going to find it on Facebook. But I'll tell you where you're finding it. You're finding God's Word. You'll find it in Christ. And so let us be people of the book. The Muslims, the Muslims accuse us of being people of the book. But I wonder if that were the case. I wonder if, if we were put on trial, if we would have enough evidence to, be, to, 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 to really be people of the book. And then thirdly, resist the temptation of confident thinking. Oh, to have confident thinking is a pitfall that many of us fall into, I think. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, it says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. First Corinthians 10, 12, there, let him that thinketh, he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. We mustn't look down our noses at somebody else. We must not think highly of ourselves. And then Romans chapter 12, in verses 1 through 3. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. We are what we are by the grace of God. And when we consider this, how can we think of ourselves very highly? 
Listen, there's only one hero in our story, and that's God. Be confident, but not in ourselves. Glory, but only in Christ and His cross. The psalm prayed the prayer, the psalmist prayed the prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. May God help us to want what the psalmist wanted. At the end of the day, our life story will be over. And we'll all have words of our mouth and meditation of our heart. Will it be acceptable to God? May God get the glory in it all. And everything that we do, inside as well as outside, our thoughts, our words, our deeds, every bit of it, may it all be acceptable to Him. Look, I could look at it like this. As I navigate through life, I could try to do things acceptable to you and to and to this church, and to that church, and to this person, and that person, and this person. And I can stress myself out over that. And as Christians, we, we should not want to try to offend people. But ultimately, we probably will offend somebody along the way. It's hard in this life not to offend somebody. I mean, think about it. You go to, it used to be somebody get offended as a preacher if they forgot to shake somebody's hand. And now with COVID going on, you might offend somebody if you do shake their hand. close.